Church, as we're worshiping, here's what I want you to do. I want you to open a hand, open your heart, however you want to do it. But let's invite the Lord Jesus more fully into our lives. Lord Jesus, would you come into this place? Holy Spirit, would you come into our hearts and our lives? Father God, would you let us know your love? Father, would you let us be a people that don't just know you on Sunday morning, but know you on Monday and Tuesday and Wednesday, that know you in the secret spots. Lord, would you let us be a people of gratitude? Lord, would you give us hearts that are sensitive to your voice? Father, would you give us ears that would hear and see and eyes that would watch and know your gracious hand moving in our lives? Father, we're not real interested in doing church, but we are really interested in knowing you and being known by you and journeying together. So Father, we open our hearts, we open our hands, we open our minds. We offer our bodies as a living sacrifice to you again and we ask that you Lord Jesus would come in and inhabit our praise church let's give Jesus a praise Lord we praise you Father we give you glory amen 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 thank you guys good morning what a funny time and place we are in our whole country in existence. I see some faces back post-COVID, oh my goodness, and some faces gone. Man, the Lord Jesus is here with us, huh? Amen. Come on. So, you know, what we are really um, probably most focused on as a church is um, not that you would come and experience great worship, although we love great worship. Not that you would come and hear a great message, although we love a great message, but what we're most interested in is that you would actually come and taste and see of the Lord's presence and you would begin to practice uh, his presence and even his infilling spirit Monday through Sunday or Monday through Saturday as you journey. Amen. Yeah? yeah? How many of you know that religion doesn't get us very far? Yeah. But relationship with this Jesus will carry us the distance. Right. Come on. Some days I get up and I go, Lord, I don't love church very much. <laughs> if you're talking about the religion and the organization, but I love church if we're talking about relationship with you and relationship with people, right? Yes. This is the messy Jesus journey and we are in it. Come on. Okay, Stacy and team, thank you guys. Um, I think Missy and Daniel were going to lead us, but they got COVID and got stuck in California and oh my goodness. So anyway, here we are. Good morning. I want to look into the camera, too, and say good morning. Davidi, welcome back. I'll look behind the camera. Welcome back from Albania. We're glad to have you. Um, whew, here we are. Okay, I am in John. Um, turn to John 1, if you will. And we're going to do a couple interesting things today. Um, we're going to take probably a 30,000-foot viewpoint um, on this first chapter uh, of John, and we're actually going to focus on John the Baptist. So if you were here last week, um, we took a look at the Apostle John, I don't know if you, if you remember, but quick recap, uh, we actually unpacked some scriptures and painted him um, as probably an arrogant man, um, probably a vindictive man. Uh, Jesus called him a son of thunder, and that wasn't because of his mild bedside manner, right? So he had an attitude problem, potentially an anger problem. That's right. <laughs> um, some of you may identify, that's good. If there's hope for Apostle John, there's hope for you. And then uh, we sort of walked through how at the very end of his life, he was reduced to love. His last words were, little children love one another. So here's what we're going to do is we're going to flip today. And I, I guess I should also just quick recap. What we looked at uh, was that as these words were penned, it was the fourth gospel, the final gospel penned, and the apostle John, the way I imagine it, was probably sitting um, with a number of other people or, or young men and women that he had actually discipled and walked with. They were most likely in some sort of small group setting. And uh, probably John the Elder, and I get that from 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, because if you look at 2nd and 3rd John, it actually begins with, the elder. So John the elder is probably penning it. The apostle John is probably sharing these memories of his relationship with the Lord Jesus. And then you have a group of people around who respected John as a saint and revered John as a father. So there's this really precious, intimate thing. It's one of my favorite gospels. And arguably, the first chapter is one of the high notes of theology that's probably ever been written. So that's a lot to get our hands around. Okay, 
Uh, here's what we're going to do. We're going to take a look at John the Baptist, so we're not going to dig fully through chapter 1, but we're going to look at some things in chapter 1. We're going to flip over and look at John chapter 3, just a couple of passages there, because I want you to see something. We're going to cross-reference a passage in Luke and Matthew, um, and then, then we're going to try to put together who this guy John the Baptist was. He's actually mentioned like 89 times um, in the Gospels. So he's, he's a very important guy. It's very interesting that, that uh, John chapter 1 goes from in the beginning, and then it goes right into John the Baptist. So we're going to look at John the Baptist. Um, we're going to look at, at this idea of uh, creation and recreation. I'll unfold that in just a minute. We're going to look at, um, w- I'm going to do a weird pivot on you, um, and we're going to look at what is a uh, transformational leader. Um, and, and I'm going to propose what sort of John is, he's initiating a transformation, if you will. Um, and we're going to introduce sort of some of that um, transformation that John's uh, introducing. And then we're going to end with this question of why is John the Baptist the greatest, okay? Because Jesus calls him that in two of the Gospels. Um, so let's start, and I'm going to start in John 1, verse 6, and we'll just jump right in and pick up right there. Um, So, if I haven't fully confused you, this is John the Apostle, who is the Beloved, John the Beloved, um, who is most likely recounting all of this. You have John the Elder, who's a different guy, who's writing it down, and now John the Elder and John the Apostle are talking about John the Baptist. So, are you fully confused now? Okay, you got it. So, we're getting ready to talk about John the Baptist. Here we go. If your name's John in here today, you're in good company. Okay, verse 6. There was a man sent from God whose name was? Oh my goodness, y'all are good. He came as a witness to testify concerning that light. What's the light? Jesus. So that through him all might believe. He himself was not the light. He came only as a witness to the light. The true light that gives light to everyone was coming into the world. That's King Jesus. He was in the world and Though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. He came to that which was his own, but, he, but his own didn't receive him. So who, is it, who are his own? Israel, the Jews, that's exactly right. Yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Now, I mentioned last week, I think it's worth mentioning again, at this point, about 100 AD, um, you probably have one or two Jewish believers for every about 125,000 Greek or Gentile believers. Really amazing. So this massive transformation and shift has happened even in the population of those who are following and walking with King Jesus. Verse 13, children born not of natural descent, nor of human decision, or a husband's will, but born of God. The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only Son who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. We're going to deal with some of that next week. Verse 15, John testified concerning him. Now, which John are we talking about here? Baptist, that's exactly right. John the Baptist, or John the Baptizer, if you prefer. He cried out saying, this is he of whom I said, he who comes after me has surpassed me because he was before me. That's a mouthful, right? He who comes after me, so John is saying, he who comes after me is King Jesus, uh, has surpassed me because he was before me. So Jesus was actually born after John. But how many of you know Jesus was alive before he was born? Okay, all right. There we go. So out of his fullness, we all have received grace in place of the grace already given. For the law was given through Moses. We've been in Exodus the last few number of months. But grace and truth came through Christ Jesus. No one has ever seen God, but the one and only Son who is himself God is in closest relationship with the Father has made him known. Now, side note here. One of the probably core values of Saltbox is that we are a fiercely relational church. And here's why, right there. The Son, who is himself God. Is Jesus God? Yes. Yes. And is in closest relationship with the Father. Who's the Father? God. Has made him known. So everything from Genesis to Revelation becomes this fiercely relational sort of unfurling of 
of relationship with God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, and then we are invited to be grafted into that relationship. So this whole idea of church is not a building. I could care less about the building. It's not even a gathering. It's not a cool place to go or a great thing to do. It's actually a group of people who are coming together to be in intimate, consistent, ongoing, however imperfect relationship with one another as we journey with King Jesus is God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit are in relationship. Amen? That's church. That's worth fighting for. That's worth going to. That's worth being involved in. It's not a building. It's not a place. That's why God can actually bring to an end our time here at this spot, move us to a different spot, and guess what? He's still with us. It's a relational journey. And why do we have a one-year Bible on our table out there? If you don't have one, grab one. So that the idea is that you would invite on a daily basis, not just Sunday, but you would begin to actually open the Word, and you'd go, Lord, would you speak to me? You won't believe how many Christians I talk to that go, I don't understand the Word. And I go, I get it. That's what, that's what we're doing in here. But open that up and begin to go, Lord Jesus, would you speak to me? And as you consistently do that, you will notice the still, small voice of the Lord beginning to speak to you. All right, that's what we're about. Let's keep going. Now, verse 19. Now, this was John's testimony. Now, which John are we talking about? The baptizer, that's right. When Jewish leaders in Jerusalem sent priests and Levites to ask him who he was. Now, this is really important. We're going to come back to it kind of at the end of my message. Why is John a transformational leader? What does it take to be a transformational leader? Here's what he said. Verse verse 20. He did not fail to confess, but confessed freely, I am not the Messiah. So I want you to know right here, there's this temptation in John um, to make himself greater than he was. Hold that. We'll come back to it. But he passes the test. He did not fail to confess, but he confessed freely, I am not the Messiah. Then they asked him, then who are you? Are you Elijah? Now, quick cross-reference here. You don't have to go there, but I'm going to flip back to Malachi 4. Last book in the Old Testament. Here's what Malachi 4, verse 5 and 6 says. See, I will send the prophet Elijah to you before the great and dreadful day of the Lord comes. He will turn the hearts of the parents to their children and the hearts of the children to their parents. Okay, so all the religious leaders know that before the Messiah comes, who's going to come? Elijah. So fascinating. Now, They ask him, then who are you? Are you Elijah? They're looking for the Messiah. And he says, I am not. Then they say, are you the prophet? They're asking him really again, are you the Messiah? And he answered, no. Finally, they said, who are you? Give us an answer to take back to those who sent us. What do you say about yourself? This is so key. This is key for us as individuals. This is key for us as a church. This is key for pastors and leaders everywhere. This is... This is so important. But before we go to all that importance, I want to read something that Jesus said in Matthew eleven fourteen. Make a note if you want. You can flip and read it if you like. Matthew eleven fourteen. Now, imagine who Jesus is talking about in Matthew eleven. John the Baptist. Somebody got it. Way to go. Okay. So verse fourteen. And if you are willing to accept it, he is the Elijah who was to come. Okay. So hang on a second. So we just read here that. He did not fail to confess, but he, John, confessed freely, I am not the Messiah. Then they asked him, then who are you? Are you Elijah? What does he say? I'm not. But you have Jesus in Matthew 11 saying that he is. How How do we reconcile this? People love to find little things like this in Scripture and go, see, it's not true. I love it when they do that. I'm like, come on, let's talk about that. Is Scripture um, uh, contradicting itself? No. Is, uh, is John the Baptist literally Elijah? No. But is he coming in the power or in the anointing of Elijah? Yes. So, so, so both are absolutely true. And Jesus is, in a way, what Jesus is saying is not only um, was John coming in Matthew eleven fourteen 14 in the spirit and power of Elijah, but I, Jesus, am the Messiah. So Jesus is actually saying in that Matthew 11 chapter, I am God, I am the Messiah, I am the promised one. And one of the the signs that you know that that is true is John the Baptist came in the spirit and power of Elijah. Make sense? 
So you have them, when they ask him, are you Elijah? What I love about John the Baptist is you have this uh, incredible humility as like a 30-something-year-old. So rare. If you're 30-something, you know. Maybe you don't know. If you're 50 or 60-something, you're looking at the 30-year-olds going, oh, we know, right? But when we, in fact, we just looked last week at John, uh, the beloved, John the Apostle, um, who's almost 100 at the point this is being written, but we're looking back to when John was uh, you know, below 30, in his 20s probably, and he is this arrogant, self-righteous, angry, he's asking to call down fire on the little Sumerian town, remember that? In, in fact, uh, you know, I was thinking after I left on Sunday, I always think of the things I should have said, right? That's what I wake up, uh, you know, about 3 a.m. Monday morning and think about. What should I have said or what shouldn't I have said? But I was thinking, when John went to this town, he preached. They didn't receive him well. He's like, Lord Jesus, can I call down fire? I mean, what anger, what vindictiveness, right? What a young man. But I was thinking, that's not unlike me coming, walking out on a Sunday morning going, Wilmington didn't respond well to me today. Lord, can I call down? I'm, you, you, it's just, it, 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 it's kind of mind-boggling. Anyway, I'm, I'm sort of jesting and perhaps off topic. But anyway, so Elijah said, uh, or the, he said, then who are you? Elijah. And John says, I am not. Are you the prophet? And he answers, no. Finally, they said, who are you? Give us an answer to take back to those who sent us. What do you say about yourself? Verse 23. John replied in the words of Isaiah the prophet, I am the voice of one calling in the wilderness. Make straight the way for the Lord. He's quoting Isaiah the prophet right there. Verse 24, now the Pharisees who had been sent questioned him. Why then do you baptize if you are not the Messiah, nor Elijah, nor the prophet? And he says, I love this because again, he's very self-aware. I baptize with water, John replied, but among you stands one you do not know. He is the one who comes after me, the thongs of whose sandals I am not worthy to untie. This all happened at Bethany on the other side of the Jordan where John was baptizing. Okay, flip over with me to John chapter 3. Now, let's, let's dip into this just a, a bit before I even talk about this. There's been, um, there's been 400 years of silence uh, from God in Israel at this point, okay? So um, you have this big span, um, and even in all the writings that happened during those 400 years, not once does it say, thus God said, or and God said. You don't, you don't get any of that. So there's been 400 years of total silence from God, and all of a sudden, this guy John the Baptist shows up, and he probably uh, was trained or hung out with this group called the Essenes, who lived on the um, bank of the uh, Dead Sea, and they lived way out, and they did all this ceremonial washing. It's actually where the Dead Sea Scrolls were found, if you know about those. But John was probably trained there, and then all of a sudden, John busted out and he's wearing camel hair. Have you ever petted a camel? Scratchy critter. Uh, and, and a leather belt um, and he eats locusts and honey. And this is weird, right? Can you imagine if I camped out somewhere and wore a goat skin or camel skin and ate locusts and honey and tried to baptize people in the river? I mean, but that's what happened. And all of a sudden um, there is this like transformation that begins to happen in Israel. And so people are all of a sudden leaving all the cities and they're going out to where John is. This isn't like, you know, when you want to go plant a mega church, you go pick the big city and you go plant it and you do cool stuff and everybody comes. No, no, no. John went to the most obscure, strange, uh, weird location and everybody left the cities and went to him. He's out baptizing, and his message is so difficult. He's not telling funny stories or cool jokes or making people feel good. He's actually saying, repent. Like he's preaching a hard message, and everyone is flocking to him. And so you have all these religious people who are really frustrated and going, what in the world is going on? It's like, you know, the church growth people. It's like this anomaly. So they're all going, what's happening? Why is the church growing? This is weird. And so they go out to see what's happening. So now, uh, here's where I want to pick up, um, John chapter 3, and we're going to pick up in verse 20, let's do uh, 24. So John chapter 3, verse 24. So John has the largest ministry in Israel. Okay, get that in your head a second. John's running the big mega church, okay, and everybody's coming, and it's cool, right? It's weird cool. But everybody wants to go see what in the world is happening out in the wilderness. He's preaching repent, and he's baptizing people. Okay, let's pick up. 
verse 24 of chapter 3. This was before John was put in prison. An argument developed between some of John's disciples, John had disciples if you didn't know, and a certain Jew over the matter of ceremonial washing. That's just, they washed multiple times a day according to the Mosaic law, and they took that to an nth degree. Anyway, separate subject, but verse 26, they came to John, this is John the Baptist, and said to him, Rabbi, the man who was with you on the other side of the Jordan. Now, who are we talking about? King Jesus, that's right. The one you testified about. Look, he is baptizing, and everyone is going to him. So what are the disciples saying? What are John the Baptist, John the baptizer, what are his disciples saying? Everybody's leaving our church. Everybody's leaving. This is terrible. What are we going to do? Nobody's here. Everybody's leaving us, and they're going over here to this other guy that you told us about. And here's what John says. I love this. In fact, I would actually say if there's a life verse that I have, I have a collection of life verse. I have these morning declarations that I will get out and declare over our life and my life and our family and ministry and the whole bit. This is one of them. To this, John replied, a person can receive only what is given from heaven. So powerful. So what John, as this young man, I have no idea how the Lord Jesus worked it inside of him uh, as such a young man, but he knew beyond a shadow of a doubt that he was coming to the end of his ministry. King Jesus was taking off in his ministry, and he was going to go down, and King Jesus was going to arise. I mean, and and then the humility not to fight that or argue against that is absolutely mind-boggling to me. Verse 28, you yourselves can testify that I said, I am not the Messiah, but I am sent ahead of him. The bride, now, who's the bride? The church. church. Say, "I'm I'm the bride. You're the bride. The bride belongs to the bridegroom. Who's the bridegroom? King Jesus, the friend who attends the bridegroom. Now, who's the friend? John the baptizer. Waits and listens for him and is full of joy when he hears the bridegroom's voice. That joy is mine and is now complete. He must become greater and I must become less. Father, as we unpack your words today, would you enliven our hearts? Father, I pray that you would change some of us, Lord. I pray that you'd fill some of us with your presence. Father, could we be a people that has eyes and ears and hearts that are tuned into you, seeking after you? Father, not copycatting what we've seen other people doing, but authentically walking with you. Father, would you raise up a church here in this place and in this house and in this city and churches across this city that are empowering people to hear and know and walk with you in fiercely relational ways? In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Any of you guys know Billy Graham? A couple of you? I'm glad you laughed. A few years ago, uh, when Billy Graham died, um, he had a, a funeral up in Montreat, and only a couple thousand people were invited. I was not. You had to be important, and you had to be a somebody, and, you know, there was a few people that got invitations. And I've always loved Billy Graham, and there's something about the way that he carried or, or stewarded whatever a person can only receive what is given from heaven. However, he stewarded that anointing or calling or whatever was given to him from heaven that, that uh, went, it spanned the distance, it went the test of time, and I've always had such respect for him. And I said to Abby, uh, my wife, I said, let's, let's just go up there and be near his funeral. It's kind of funny. I was like, let's just, let's just go, because I love this guy. And so we went, and we got a hotel, and we stayed there, and uh, we went over to where they were having the funeral, and there was this big you know, line of people, uh, the security guys, and guess what they said to me? Yeah. You can't get in. <laughs> I said, okay, thanks. And we got in the car, and we were driving while the funeral was happening. It was, it was like, I think it was live streamed. That was before COVID live stream, but they were live streaming it anyway. And uh, we, we turned it on, and so we were listening to it, and we are driving down the road, and there was a, um, a restore. You ever been to one of those? The, the home store, like, you know, I don't know, it's home stuff. We're, and Abby and I are always remodeling our houses. We're on our, I think, our third house remodel and flip. Um, we're pastors, you know, so you got to do stuff like that. So uh, we're on our, so we're, we're remodeling and we're looking for, I don't know, a slab, a countertop or a sink. I can't remember exactly. But we go into this place and the funeral's going on with Billy Graham and we're walking around and I look over on the restore and there's this little section of books. 
I was like, oh, that's interesting. I've never seen books in the restore, but, you know, whatever. So I walked over, and there was a pile of books, and I have no idea why, but I started shuffling through the pile, and at the bottom of them, guess what I found? A Billy Graham book. I was like, oh, this is cool. So I picked it up, and I opened it up, and guess what I found inside the front cover? A signature. It's really fascinating. It's just, it just like this cool little moment. And guess what he had under his signature? Let me read it to you. He must become greater, and I must become less. Now, let's back up from this, and let's take a look at the beginning of John. We're going to take a look at the transformational leader that John was. Uh, We're going to talk about some of what John introduced, and then we're actually sort of going to flip it and go, uh, why was John um, the greatest? So here we go. In uh, John chapter 1, so this is now the the gospel of John. This is confusing, all the Johns. This is the gospel of John. So in John chapter 1, 2, and 3, you could make a case that uh, John the apostle is mimicking um, the first three chapters of Genesis. You're going to have to go with me there just a second. I'm not going to dig fully deep into it, but uh, we could actually go through, and, and if you actually read, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. If we flip back to Genesis 1... See if I can find Genesis 1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. So you can make a case that uh, there is actually um, John, the apostle, is, is reproducing or um, retooling the creation story. So here's what I want you to get. There's creation, and then John, the apostle, is beginning to say there's recreation. Okay, so you got creation, and then John is writing about recreation. Uh, you have um, creation, and John is beginning to write. Now, this is not John the Baptizer; this is John the Apostle. That John is writing then about creation and new creation. Okay, hang with me. New creation. Second Corinthians five seventeen says, "If anyone is in Christ, they are a new creation. The old is gone; the new has come." Okay, so then you can actually begin to make a case that the Apostle John is writing about creation and recreation, uh, creation and new creation, or creation and transformation. So what John the Apostle is beginning to capture here is this idea that you and I, if we're willing to surrender our lives to him, are made new in Christ. We are, we are able to experience not just creation. God created the world. We all get to see and experience that. But we can actually experience a recreation or a transformation. So John is beginning to pen, uh, John the Beloved is beginning to to say and pen this um, creation and transformation or creation and recreation. So let's then pause for just a minute um, when let's let's zoom out for a second and let's ask the question, what is a transformational leader? Okay, John's a transformational leader. You have Old Testament, right? You have Mosaic Law. We've just come out of Exodus. We've been looking at all of that, all of the the Old Testament and some of the Mosaic Laws. So what is then a transformational leader? I'm going to give you a couple of more modern, applicable things that I think hopefully you'll identify with. A transformational leader is one who serves the highest and best interest of other people. A transformational leader is someone who is not using their position to fulfill um, emotional or spiritual or relational deficits. Okay, so, so go there a second. If John the Baptist was attempting to fill emotional or spiritual or relational deficits, when they came to him and said, are you the Messiah? Said, yeah. yeah, I am. I propose that a transformational leader is one who is serving for the transformation and the empowerment of other people instead of creating power and position or attention for themselves. So again, when the people come and his his apostles or his disciples are going, the, the attention is leaving you, he says, he's got to become greater and I've got to become less. When you're young, you tend to think of building an empire. When you get older, you begin to think of building a legacy. It's the difference. 
So I would propose to you that a transformational leader is one who has been transformed by God. In other words, can you be used as a transformational leader if you haven't first been transformed? No. Now I've got good news for you, because you're probably like me. I am still being transformed. I am the most imperfect human that I know. And every day of my life, I am faced with that reality. And I invite Jesus to continue the creation and the transformation. I want to invite you into that same journey. Come on. Somebody say, amen. amen. All right, cool. Okay, so a transformational leader um, is one who has been transformed um, and, and then they are transforming, or if we use like modern computer language, we could say upgrading uh, the old way of doing things. So they're upgrading an old operating system. So from the New Testament, uh, or the Old Testament rather, to the New Testament, do we have a new God? No, it's a, it's a newer expression or a more full understanding of the same God, the same character. He is, he is unchangeable. We just looked at Moses in the Old Testament as we went through Exodus. We could talk about Nehemiah, David, Ruth, the Apostle Paul. These are all leaders who first experienced a transformation, and then they became transformational. Now, some of you are sitting there, and you're going, well, I'm never going to do that. Abraham and Sarah in the Old Testament. Anybody read about them? <laughs> all Abraham did was transform his family. That's all he did. He believed God to transform he and Sarah, and they had a son of promise named Isaac. Listen to me. Start thinking legacy, not empire. Start thinking kingdom of God, not our church. Start thinking um, what can God do in and through us as we come together as a body? Not, what is God going to do and what's he going to elevate me to? You want to become a church. If we want to become a church that actually transforms a city, we're going to come alongside other brothers and sisters and other believers, and we're going to begin to fan this flame and go, come on, Lord Jesus, use a bunch of broken people like us to exhibit your kingdom power and glory. That's church. Some of you are probably sitting there going, well, I'm not a transformational leader. If you have been or are being transformed, you're a transformational leader. Amen. Has Michael been transformed? Yes. Is Michael being transformed? Yes. yes. Will I continue to be transformed? Yes. yes. Are you the same way? Yes. If you're already perfect, this probably isn't a good spot for you. <laughs> we'll recommend some other churches. Okay, where are we? If you're in here today and you don't have kids, you can't think legacy. Let me go there just a minute. The Apostle Paul didn't have any kids. He's got more spiritual kids than anybody on the planet. Come on. Okay. <clears throat> Let's talk about just for a minute, what is the transformation that John introduces? And in fact, John the baptizer, or John the Baptist, is in many ways speaking of a bunch of stuff he doesn't even know. So he introduces Jesus um, as the once and for all blood of the lamb that covers the lentils. Remember, we just went through Exodus. So it, he's introducing Jesus um, as the lamb of God. In fact, we didn't even read it. We might get to it next week. But in, in verse 1, verse 20, or chapter 1, excuse me, verse 29, it says, The next day John the baptizer saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Look, the lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. It's the most prophetic declaration that anyone has ever or probably will ever give. Behold, the lamb of God. God. It is, this Jesus is the lamb. It, he, his blood becomes the blood that goes over those lintel posts of our lives and hearts, and he saves us once and for all. So John begins to declare prophetically that which he doesn't even know, that Jesus is not the old Moses. Jesus is the new Moses. Jesus isn't the old Adam. Jesus is the new Adam. Jesus is the Messiah, not just is he, is he the Messiah, but John is even saying and grasping that Jesus is the Savior of the world. John grasps already prophetically, this is John the baptizer, that Jesus is the bridegroom who's going to return for who? 
a bride. He's already paving the way for the book of Revelation. I mean, what John the Baptist got as a young um, man and the, the humility and the transformation that must have happened inside of him for him to become this transformational leader is absolutely remarkable to me. John actually introduces the baptism of the Spirit and fire. He t- says Jesus is going to baptize with, uh, the, with fire and with the Spirit foretelling Pentecost, Acts 1, 2, and 3. So John is capturing things uh, probably in his heart that he doesn't even fully grasp in his mind, but he is standing as a mouthpiece of God and he is issuing these bold prophetic declarations that are absolutely earth-shaking and everyone's running out of the woods to see him. What a guy. John introduces the infilling power of the Spirit. You could make a case that John was the first one uh, written about that the Holy Spirit actually dwelled inside. In the Old Testament, the Holy Spirit dwells on Uh, In the New Testament, you get this infilling of the Holy Spirit, and arguably you could say John was the first who experienced that. So let's, let's bring this together right here. What is it that makes, well, let me, let me lead with this. Uh, Luke 7, 28, if you want to make a note, or if you want to flip there, perhaps I have a marker, we'll see. I don't, so I'm just going to read it to you. (laughs) Luke 7, Uh, 28 says, I tell you, this is Jesus talking, among those born of women, there is no one greater than John the baptizer. Matthew 11, 11, Jesus is talking again. Truly I tell you, among those born of women, there has not risen anyone greater than John the Baptist. Okay, here's the question. It's the question of the day. For us in this passage, it's the question of the day for us in our lives. What makes John so great? What makes John so great? Here's what I want to propose to you. That in order to be a transformational leader, in order to transform, experience transformation, and then be equipped with the infilling power of God to transform a family, or to transform a place of business, or to transform a school, or to transform, you fill in the blank, transform anything, I, am, uh, I would propose to you that you have to have certain internal things settled between you and King Jesus. I'm going to propose to you that you've got to have some things settled like your self-esteem. Oh. I'm 41, I'll just be honest a second. And I've never in my entire life thought of myself as an insecure person. And I'm having these moments where I go, gosh, I've spent a long time being insecure and I didn't even know it. You might sit out there and you go, I'm not insecure. (laughs) Here's what I'm proposing, that at some point in John's journey, and I don't know John the Baptist's exact journey, I've sat in where the Essenes were, and I think he probably studied under some of the Essenes. They were one of the religious groups of the day. But at some point in his journey, as he studied the scrolls of Isaiah, and as he studied the Old Testament, as he studied the Torah, somehow he settled his own issues of self-esteem and self-worth, his own lust for power or money or fame or influence or Instagram followers. or he, He somehow settled his own issues of identity. He somehow settled his own emotional and spiritual needs And it's like as you get that stuff settled before King Jesus, you are able to be transformed, first of all, but then you are able to be equipped with the infilling power of Jesus to transform. What made John the Baptist the greatest, I believe, is that he settled those issues before King Jesus. Somehow he was able to interact with and that infilling power of the Holy Spirit, and he had those things settled so that he became a transformational leader so that he was able even to boldly declare things that he didn't even understand, so that he became the very Elijah, the forerunner that went ahead of King Jesus. Can you imagine the honor? Now listen to me, church. We become the current modern forerunner of King Jesus in every situation we enter. We have the full call and capacity and lordship of King Jesus living inside of us. If you're in Jesus, Jesus is in you, and you have then the calling and capacity to become that same type of forerunner in every situation you go into. 
Come on, that's what this is all about. It's not a place you come and we sing a song and read a couple words and it's like, oh man, let's go eat lunch. No, no, no. This is about relationship with the creator of the universe. In the beginning was the word and the word was God and the word was with God. And that God then comes and dwells inside of us. That's worth following. That's worth reading about. That's worth giving our lives for. That's worth laying it all down for. That is the gospel. And that's what made this funny guy that wore a leather belt and camel hair and ate locusts and honey. Amelia and I were just reading about that and we went and picked up a cricket. Can you imagine? This guy was nutso. But what made him great? He was so, he had his internal mess in order, not by his own power. Get me, you can't make yourself transformed. King Jesus came. He lived a perfect life, fully God, fully man. He went to a cross. He died. He gave it all. He was buried. Then he broke the chains of death and hell. He rose from the dead. And he is this risen king that you can then invite into your life. And as you invite him into your life and as you journey with him, you'll hear me talk a lot about a five-year journal. What do you think I settle in my five-year journal? Issues of self-esteem and self-worth and power and identity and emotional needs, and spiritual needs, and relational needs. And it's this interactive thing that I'm with, and I'm going, okay, Lord, the healthier I am, guess what's going to be between Abby and I? A healthier marriage. The healthier I am with him, guess how I'm going to be as a father? Healthier. The healthier I am, guess what's going to happen at church? All right, now flip it. The healthier you are, what's going to happen at home? What's going to happen with your roommates? What's going to happen with your spouse? What's going to happen at work? I was in a meeting the other day, and I looked at the person, and I said, you know, the hardest thing in life is everywhere you go, you're there too. Oh, boy, have I learned that again and again. But if you can begin this journey of letting the Lord Jesus get inside and deal with you in this initial transformation, then you can actually become a person who brings transformation. That's the gospel. You might sit there and go, Michael, there's no hope for me. And I would go, you're in the best place you have ever been because you're ready to surrender it all before King Jesus and go, Lord, here am I. And there's nothing else I can do but surrender it all and lay it down before you. That's what John the Baptist did. That's what we're called to do. Stacy, would you bring your team back up? Let's close our eyes for just a minute. Let's rest in this a second. We're going to end in a closing song and then dismiss. I'd encourage you to open a hand, open a heart. Open your mind, open whatever you want, but still your gaze upon him for just a few minutes. Lord Jesus, I believe with everything in me that you've called everyone under the sun to surrender their lives to you and to become transformational leaders. And in John the Baptist, we see this transformational person who somehow settled all those deep internal hurts and hang-ups and mess that we all deal with so that in the moment of testing, he could point to you and say, I'm not the Messiah. I'm not Elijah. I'm just a voice. That's all I am is a voice. Father, would you fill this church with a group of people who get to the point where they can say, we are just a voice pointing to you, King Jesus. prayer team, would you guys come? Would you be available up front? Would you also, a couple of you, be available by these back two doors? We don't have a lot of space in our little room here. But here's what we're going to do is during this closing song, I'm going to invite you to stand with me. We're just going to sing. But as we sing, if you need special prayer, I'd love for you to come to one of these people and just say, hey, I need prayer. It might be a marriage thing. It might be a finance thing. You might want to pray for healing. God heals, you know that? He's real. You might have something deep inside of you that this has touched and you'd want to come up and pray with someone. Do that. 
Secondly, if you're here and you've never given your heart and life to this Jesus, I'd love to talk to you. I'll be up here at the end. But when you surrender your life to him, you begin this transformational journey where he transforms you and then equips you to be a transformer of people and culture and society. Stand with me. Let's worship the Lord in a closing song. If you need special prayer, find one of those people that stood up. Jesus is in the house. Let's worship.